So, today I'm here to talk to you about what does supply chain security and spherical chickens have in common? What can we learn from spherical chickens? So first off, where does this come from? And a little bit about who am I? So I'm a product manager at Synopsys. Uh, some of you may be familiar with a product that I look after called Black Duck. And this is really a next generation software composition analysis or SCA and supply chain solution. The other thing as well is I have something in common with our um, speaker later on today, Sadar so Brin. So I actually went to see him at the O2 uh, this weekend. And me and him have something in common in that we both studied physics. So I studied theoretical physics, Darwin also studied, uh, I think it was mathematical physics, but it's more or less the same. And one of the tools that we often use in physics is we use this joke of spherical chickens. And the reason kind of why we use that is it's a way of simplifying problems. If we want to solve an equation, if we want to build a model of the universe, we can make it very, very complicated or we can make it very, very simple. And if we're trying to get answers, using that technique is really, really useful when we're trying to address risks in security, but also risks or mathematical or physical problems. So getting into that. So like I said, um, I tried to find a good image of a spherical chicken, but I couldn't, so I'm using a spherical cow, but the analogy works just as well. And the focus of what physics is really trying to do with this analogy is if you're trying to think of throwing a ball back and forth or if you're bouncing a pendulum or whatever it is, you can make it very, very complicated or you can make it very, very simple. A lot of you probably remember things like Newton's first law. A lot of the times when you're doing that, you're ignoring things like air resistance. You might ignore some other factors. You can make it complicated or you can make it simple. Making it simple makes maths easier and it means you can solve and address the problems. And I'm going to talk about how you can use that and learn from that to solve the problems and challenges in supply chain security. Just before we get into that, a couple of quick definitions. Hopefully most of you know what the supply chain is. This is really talking about all the different components that go into building the products, applications that we build. And we talk about it in the context of supply chain security for software. This is all the different software components that build applications. Most applications nowadays aren't monoliths. They are built up of lots of different components. It could be tens, hundreds, thousands, or in very large applications, it could be tens of thousands or millions. So how do you secure it and why do we care? Well, we care partially because of the guys sitting in that White House. So he issued an executive order, EO14028, and this was really in response to what we saw in the industry over the last few years. So we had the Log4j vulnerability, we had the Peace Not War issue, you already mentioned Ukraine. We saw some issues coming out from that issue. There's been things like dependency confusion, and before that there's also solar winds. So this was hackers, this was attackers targeting the software supply chain because it's a point of vulnerability, it's a point that you can um, attack to hijack applications, hijack organizations, inject malware, and eject and identify vulnerabilities. The key point here though is supply chain security is not new. We've been doing it in Black Duck for the past 10 years. Um, Log4j is just really bringing this to the forefront, it's becoming a much, much more prevalent method of attack. So, a little bit around kind of where this is going. So, I'm not gonna go through all the regulation, there's a lot of regulation, there's a lot of different acronyms. Um, you know, there's the executive order, there's the DHS, there's NIST, there's the EU CRA, so Cybersecurity Resiliency Act. I'm gonna talk a little bit around that a little bit more later on. Now every industry is gonna be different, whether you're building medical devices, web applications, financial applications, insurance, whatever it is, there are gonna be different regulations in your industry. I'm not gonna to touch on the specifics of that today, but a lot of them have very common, similar themes, and a lot of regulation is gonna be a bit more general as well, particularly when we talk about different regions, such as the UK, US, Europe, or Japan. Um, there's also supply negotiations and contracts as well. And what we're starting to see is that it, there may be a regulation in a particular space, but the negotiation that you have with your vendors might have some language around what you need to provide, what you need to specify, and what they expect from you there. So supplier contracts are becoming a key part of that. 
And if you're building software and you've not had someone ask for your SBOM for your application, chances are you will do soon. So be prepared for that. So jumping into the EU CRA a little bit. Um, now, this was meant to be enacted in 2024. That now looks like that's going to be delayed until after the European elections. So when this actually gets enacted, I don't know. Um, but when that does get enacted, we then have 36 months for when that's going to start becoming enforced. Now, I'm not going to go through the details of who this really affects, but generally speaking, this will affect anyone who builds any sort of software or digital service and wants to provide that in the EU. And I'm going to go through the S1 mandate in a little bit more detail. So manufacturers of products, of digital, digital elements, so that's anything from a website, a chatbot, a banking application, whatever it is, needs to identify and document vulnerabilities and components contained within the product, including drawing up a software bill of materials in a commonly used machine-readable format. So that basically means not a PDF, please. So generating an SBOM, collecting what other software components that you're relying on, what are important to your applications, and making it so that you can then share that information. The second part, at least the top level dependencies of a product. And I'm going to come to back to that point in a second. But really what this is really targeting and addressing, and it might be able to see it over here, is this looking at all software products. Yes, there's different tiering, but if you build any digital product, any digital software element, you are going to be bound by the CRA in some form or another. So where do you start? So um, one of the things that we do every year is publish something called the OSLA report. This is really looking at open source components used in applications. And really what this highlights is when you talk about building a software bill of materials, what you're really talking about primarily there is understanding what are the open source components you use. Whether you know it or not, your applications are built of open source components. And from the OSLA report, we can see that you know, majority of applications have open source in. And also, the majority of applications are actually open source. Up to 75, 85% of all of the software components that we use on a daily basis, from smartwatches, phones, to clickers, to microphones, everything has software in it, and it uses open source components. It is the foundation of most of our digital uh, technology. So you need to understand it. You need to know what you're using, and you need to catalog it. So this is where along came SBOMs. So as I said, supply chain security is not new. SBOMs are. And what they really did is they defined a machine-readable format that we can use to share and communicate this information. They brought in transparency, and they defined a specification. But it brings with it some challenges. So SBOMs can be huge. I said before, the product I look after, Black Duck, is a web-based application. Our SBOM, which is effectively a JSON file, is over 10 megabytes in size. It's huge. And we're a relatively modest application. If you look at something like a, a car, a plane, a bus, the amount of software within there, we're talking millions of lines of code. The SBOM for something like that would be enormous. How are you going to generate that? How are you going to produce it? So this is where the content starts to matter. And if we look at the Cyclone DX and the SPDX specification, which are the two primary standards, they have a lot of different fields that you can populate, 460 for Cyclone DX. So the content matters. What information are you putting in there? What are you sharing to your vendors? How could that be used by your vendors? Or how could it be used by people who are then going to consume that SBOM in a malicious way as well? These are things that you need to start thinking about. If you're going to provide this data, how are you going to collect it? Are you going to try and do it manually, or are you going to automate it? And finally, the last point I'll touch on here is, do you really want to put a lot of additional burden on your suppliers if they have to mandate and provide this data to you? Be cognizant of what impact that is going to have on them as well. So going back to that point earlier about the EU CRA, so their focus was on the direct dependencies of software components. And I'm going to tell you that I don't think that is enough. We should not aim for the minimum. We should all aim to catalog all dependencies in our software. And why? Because direct dependencies might be 10, 20, 30 components. But when you look at the transitives, you can very easily build up a nest like this. 
And it's this component down here where you're then going to have a vulnerability which you didn't know about, and that's going to compromise your application in some way. So the minimum should not be where we stop. We should go beyond that. We should focus on cataloging all the software dependencies, using automation, and identify both transitive and direct dependencies. The last thing I'll touch on with this slide is really around building up conventions. So yes, there's a lot of regulation, both in all the different geos, industries that we operate in, but building conventions between different industries and software operators, that's really what I would encourage, is build a convention for how you're gonna use these S-forms, how you're gonna consume it, how you're gonna share, and then we can really get to a state where we have software transparency, we can communicate this information, we can improve the security of our applications. A little word on the security aspect, okay? So most people focus on zero-day vulnerabilities, and, and I'm not disparaging that zero days are important. We saw with Log4J just how badly those types of issues can be. But one of the key takeaways we get from Osra, and this is looking at the latest report from this year, 2024, is the top 10 vulnerabilities are not new. These are going back to 2014, 2015, or even earlier. So it's not just about the new vulnerabilities. You need to track the old ones. You need to look at addressing and prioritizing those as well. So what can we do? Where can we start? So the first step is really understanding what do you actually have in your applications. Building a software industry and understanding how do your developers consume new components? How do they get into your software estate? Once you understand that process, you can then use the right tools to build that inventory catalog it, update it, and monitor for new vulnerabilities over time. And then finally, make sure you're working with your legal and compliance teams. These SBOM artifacts, they're getting written into contract language. They're something you're committing to. There could be SLAs around those. So making sure legal and your compliance teams are comfortable with that as well. Now getting back to the point of this talk, try to avoid some of the noise and distraction. As I said earlier, there's a lot of information that you can include in an SBOM. These are just some of the fields, some of the values that you can put into the SBOM. Does all of this help you? How are you going to collect this data? How are you going to automate the collection? How are you going to validate it? And what purpose does it serve? These are the questions you should ask when you're starting to look at how you're going to use an SBOM, how you're going to include it into your applications, and what's the value that it serves. So key steps to focus on them here now. So automation is key. The world is built on software. The speed and agility of software development is increasing. AI is just going to accelerate that even further. AI is going to be a driver for productivity. So you don't want to introduce speed bumps into that process for the sake of security. You want to work with the developers, with the tools, with the ecosystems that you're using to make sure you can build a secure software supply chain. So make sure you understand how you're building your applications. Don't commit to providing data manually and automate everything that you can and using the right processes and right tools in the right places. Remember the goals, improving all nations' cybersecurity and for safer, more secure digital products. That's the goal of the EU CRA. That's the goal of the executive order. And that's what we need to focus on. Thank you. Thanks.